Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Water's Edge Church. Uh, if you follow our online services, you are probably surprised to see us meeting like this this morning. Um, as it turns out, we have had a, a little coronavirus-related issue, and uh, Eric is going to talk about that a little bit more in uh, his announcements here as we do this service virtually. But, uh, of course, we still wanted to make sure that we could have a service today, that we could bring the word and some worship to you at home. So, uh, thanks for your flexibility in this. We're going to be getting this service out just a little bit later than we normally would have service because uh, we're it's Sunday morning and we're kind of scrambling this morning to make it all happen. So, thanks for your patience. Thanks for joining us. And uh, let's say a, a quick prayer and then we will get on with the rest of the service. Blessed and Heavenly Father, we've been saying for months, when we were doing the original uh, virtual services, we were, we've been saying, we had been saying, that uh, these are uncertain times and uh, things are, are pretty fluid. And it's been a great blessing to us to be able to get back together uh, for the past few weeks in order to worship in person and see each other in person. And uh, today, Lord, that's a little bit different. And I, I imagine that, that people will be having an emotional uh, reaction to that on, on some level. And so, Lord, I just, I, I pray for the body this morning. I pray that they would be close to you in this service um, and that they would still feel connected to each other despite not being able to see each other for one week. And... Um, Lord, I just pray for uh, protection over the body from the coronavirus, that, that we wouldn't have um, exposure that would stop us from, from being able to continue to meet uh, again in the future. And uh, more than anything, Lord, though, I, I, just, I, I thank you for your providence and I thank you for your uh, overseeing of our lives. We, we know that all things happen under your care and on your watch. And uh, these trials, whatever trials we're going through, these trials are, are meant for us to go through by some purpose of yours. And so I just, I thank you for that. I put trust in that and uh, I hope others can as well. And now Lord, as we move into the rest of the service, I just pray for, um, I pray for connection to you. I pray that we can deal with this little bump in the road that we can uh, not be distracted in our hearts and that we can be focused on you and uh, spending time in communion with you this morning. It's in your name that I pray all these things. Amen. All things have passed. Thank you. 
Jesus, our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our church and this is why um, late in the week we found out that a member of our household uh, was exposed to somebody who had the coronavirus here in Duluth at an outdoor basketball game and we had that member of our household uh, tested right away for the virus but we have yet to get the results back and uh, for whatever reason, it just didn't occur to me until late last night that uh, you know that exposure um, ought to affect this morning's service. And and uh, we've taken every precaution on Sunday mornings to keep those who feel comfortable coming to church safe. And and we felt like canceling the service this morning and doing it remotely instead um, was the best route to take, the most consistent route in, in light of you know, all that we've been doing. We want you to be safe. We want our reputation as a church to be safe. Um, you know, I should have realized that, said something you know, sooner than I did, but 
I think we made the, the right decision here. So I'm sorry for any inconvenience that uh, this has caused you. I mean, it's, it's, for many of us, it's great to be able to be together in person, but we just weren't able to do that today. Hopefully, um, those test results will come back negative and we'll be able to proceed uh, as normal here moving forward. Um, speaking of that, next Sunday uh, is uh, our church, uh, all church, rich, excuse me, our um, church picnic and baptism services is scheduled for next Sunday, the 19th, at uh, Camp Greenhill up in Carleton, Minnesota on Chubb Lake. And so hopefully, if, if everything is, is uh, straight and fine, uh, we'll be having that. So the service won't be here at church. Instead, it will be uh, up at Chubb Lake at Camp Greenhill. And um, it'll be outside, outdoors. So if you still want to wear a mask and stuff, you, you can. That's totally fine. But because it's outside, because we have enough room to social distance up there, we're not going to require masks at the service. Um, we'll be, be sitting outside overlooking the lake and we'll have music, we'll have a short message, and then we'll have uh, a couple of people we know for sure are, are going to be giving their testimonies and being baptized uh, down in the lake. After the service, um, we're not going to provide a picnic, but we would love and invite you to bring a picnic lunch along for yourself or for your family and uh, you know have lunch and then and then hang around at the camp and swim and just enjoy the, the outside and enjoy the fellowship for as long as you want into the afternoon okay so that's that's the plan for next week I sent out an email uh, to the church email group in regard to all the details about that if you have any questions about it just let me know you can email me at eric e -R -I -K, at the waters net or give me a call as well um, and uh, that's that. If you want to get baptized, uh, it's not too late to look into that. So you can let me know about that too. Um, so that's the main announcement that I wanted to make this morning. Um, we're not together today to take an offering, but uh, as you know, you can give online by just going to our website. There's a number of different ways to, to do that. So we'd encourage you to, to do that, um, to give to the ministry of the church and, and to give back to the Lord. So with that, um, I'd like to just pray over uh, our offering and for the remainder of the service. Father God, I thank you that, that uh, you are God and that you are on the throne and that you are leading, guiding, directing, overseeing uh, all things that, that happen, God. Those, the, the things that are predictable and the things that are unpredictable. We thank you that uh, everything that we have is a gift from you. We thank you that you call us to give some of those gifts back to you, and not because you need them, but because it's, it's good for us to do. It's good for the, the kingdom of God for us to give, um, and you want to take, take what we give and use it. God, you work through means, and, and uh, our giving is one of those means that you use to advance your kingdom to build up the church in the world, God. So thank you for all that you've given to us. Thank you for the opportunity to give some of that back to you. And I just pray that your hand would be on the rest of this service, uh, on the message that I'm about to preach. And uh, I pray that your, your hand would be on us in these tumultuous, strange, uncertain times. Yeah, we keep talking about that, but it, it, that is true. It is what it is. We need you uh, always, maybe need you now more ever uh, than before, God. So we thank you for loving us. Be with us here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to continue our series in 1 Peter this morning with a, a great text, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21. Uh, some of my favorite verses in 1 Peter are, are in this text, and I hope that it'll be a real blessing to you this morning, an encouragement, a help. So if you've got your Bibles there at home, open up to 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 21. And if you want to stand up with me as I read God's Word, I would welcome you to do that. So Peter says this 
to uh, his hearers and to all of us. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, through, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Amen. And please take a seat. So I want to start out this morning by, by asking you a question. Um, and that question is this. Is there an area in your life right now that you want to grow in for Jesus' sake? Is there an area in your life right now that you're aware of that you're wanting to grow in for Jesus' sake? So not first and foremost for your own sake, not first and foremost for anyone else's sake, but for Jesus' sake because you believe that he's calling you to grow in this regard, okay? Okay. If there is an area like that that you're feeling called to, you should be encouraged, uh, even if the progress in that area is slow, which often it is. It is. And uh, this is why you should be encouraged. Desire to grow in Christ is a sign of life in Christ. And if there is life in Christ, then growth will happen. Okay? So... So if you're desiring to make changes in your life because you feel Jesus wants you to and you want to do that for him, that's a great sign that you're alive in Christ and that Christ is alive in you, that you've been given a new heart and a new spirit because you know that's not normal behavior for somebody that, that doesn't know the Lord, that, that hasn't been born again, to want to do things for Jesus' sake, especially things that are hard because we all know that, that change is hard and that, that Jesus calls us to hard things. And so um, if that's where you're at, that's a really good sign that you're alive in Christ. And if you're alive in Christ and Christ's spirit is in you, then that change will happen. It may, it may take time. It may be gradual. It may not be all that you want it to be, but, but he is going to change you. And we know that from texts like 2 Corinthians 3.18 where Paul says, and, and we all, so, so all of us who have been born again, he's talking to Christians, all of us who are alive in Christ, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Okay? If you're in Christ, you are being transformed, you're, you're growing, you're changing, that's happening from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, Jesus, who is the Spirit. He's going to make sure that you're making progress. He's going to make sure that you're growing. And I would say he's going to make sure that you're growing specifically in that area that, that God is currently laying on your heart. So be encouraged. But but what I want to look at this morning, and then what Peter uh, does such a good job of teaching us about here in this section, is how does this growth happen? Okay, you know, Thankfully, God does not leave us alone to figure out growth or to uh, you know, do growth all by ourselves. You know, as we already saw in 2 Corinthians 3.18 this morning, He's given us His Spirit. Okay? So we have the Holy Spirit in us. He's working on us from the inside out, He's making changes. And that's one thing that he does to, to help us to grow. And another huge thing that he does to help us to grow 
is he gives us his word. And uh, this word from, from Peter, 13 through 21, is, is super helpful when it comes to Christian growth. And my prayer is that God will not only use this text you know, today to inspire us and help us to grow, but it'll be a text that we can come back to and learn from uh, in the future to help us to grow as well. So if you're wanting to grow, my hope is that this will uh, be a real help to you this morning. So here's, here's the way we're going to break it down. In today's passage on growing in Christ, Peter does three things. And we're going to look at these three things one at a time. First thing he does is that he begins and ends with the foundation and power source of all Christian growth, the gospel. Okay? Look at that. The second thing he does is that he vividly reminds us of an often neglected key to Christian growth, especially in our modern day, that being thinking, using our minds. Okay? And then the third thing that he does is he gives us three very important areas to grow in, to work on, um, all of which many of us probably rarely even consider. Okay, So we think a lot about growing, but I don't know that we think a lot about growing in these particular ways that Peter lays out for us here. So those are the things that, three things that we're going to look at this morning. So let's start with that first one. Uh, that is the foundation and power source of all Christian growth, the gospel. Okay, and we see this in the beginning of uh, verse 13, and then we see it at the end of the passage in verses 18 through 21, 21. We see Peter laying out the gospel. Okay, so before we look at those passages, though, I want to mention this, that you know, no growth of any kind is ever possible without a power source. Without a power source, you can't have growth. If you think about you know, plants, plants can't grow without sunlight. Plants can't grow without water. Okay, They need those power sources in order to grow. They're not going to grow if they don't have them. The same is true with, with human beings. Okay, We can't grow unless we have food. We can't grow unless we have water. We have to have a power source in order to grow. And the power source of Christian growth, the primary one, is the gospel. Okay, And so um, that's why Peter starts this section on growth with it. That's why he ends this section on growth with it. And that's why he continues to come back to it uh, in this letter. Remember that in verses 1 through 12, Peter didn't talk about growth at all. He just laid out uh, the good news of the gospel. Okay, so now in verses 13 on, 13 is a really important transitional verse, he's going to start to talk about growing. He's going to start to give commands and things that we should be doing. Uh, but he started with the gospel, and he continues to come back to the gospel. 18 through 21 here is a great example throughout, because he knows that not only does the, um, the gospel save us initially, but God also wants to use the gospel, the good news about himself and Christ, what Jesus did for us on the cross, to sanctify us as well. Sanctifying meaning to, to change us to become more like Christ. And, and uh, you know, once again, we, we see that in our, our 2 Corinthians 3.18 verse, where it says, And we all, with unveiled face, with, with eyes that have now been, been opened by God to the good news, we can see it now about Jesus, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into his image. So it's God causes us to be born again. He unveils our face so that we can see Jesus for who he is, appreciate Jesus for who he is, love Jesus for who he is. And then as we behold Jesus more and more day in and day out, the Holy Spirit changes us. He transforms us in and through that beholding of Christ to become more like Jesus. So not only does the gospel save us, the gospel also sanctifies us, and Peter knew that. Okay, So that's why he says right at the beginning, therefore. Okay? So therefore, meaning in light of what I've said in verses 1 through 12, do these things that I'm now going to be talking to you about throughout the rest of the letter. He starts with that 
that there for. So just a reminder of some of the things that he'd been talking about, uh, you know, earlier on. Just even just looking, scanning in your Bible at verses 1 through 5. You know, what is this good news of the gospel that he lays out? He talks about, um, you know, if we've trusted in Christ as our Lord and Savior, if we're in Christ, then that means that God has foreknown us, God has elected us, God has caused us to be born again, God has given us a living hope, God has given us a, a heavenly inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and God is keeping that inheritance for us, keeping it safe in heaven, and he is guarding us by faith to ensure that we're going to one day receive it. Okay, so so all of all of those things, that's just verses one through five, and then we've got six through twelve with further good news of the gospels. Peter says, verse 13, therefore, in light of this good news of the gospel, do these things that I'm about to now talk to you about. But it, not only that, he again comes back to the gospel in verses 18 through 21. Look at those verses. Okay, so he says, he gives those three commands that we're going to be talking about here in just a minute. And then, and then he says, knowing, so again, in light of, keeping in mind that, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. So, so keep in mind all the time as you seek to live for Christ that you were ransomed. You were bought out of slavery to sin. You were purchased by God. You were, you were purchased out of the, the feudal ways of sin that you had inherited from your sinful forefathers, okay? Um, you know, feudal, you think about feudal, feudal is purposeless, feudal is meaningless, okay? So you were living feudal, purposeless, meaningless lives when God ransomed you, yeah? And how did he ransom you? He talks about it in the next verse, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Okay, so Jesus was the sacrificial lamb that was put forth by God because he loved you so, so very much as an atonement for your sin. Somebody had to pay the price for your sin the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, shed his blood, died for you in order to ransom you from your former feudal ways. Peter says, keep that gospel in mind. And then he just goes on to, to say some more sweet things about Jesus. He, Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake. Okay, so, you know, Peter's hearers 2,000 years ago, as well as us today, it was for our sake that Jesus was made manifest at this time, okay? Those that came before Christ's coming, you know, they heard things about this coming Messiah. They were, uh, you, know, um, you know, kind of aware of what was coming, but they certainly didn't have full awareness. Um, it was in these last times for our sake that Jesus was made manifest. And it's, it's through Jesus that we are believers in God, it says. Uh, God raised Jesus from the dead, gave him glory. He's now in heaven so that our faith and hope are ultimately in God. So, so Peter starts with the good news. He ends the section with the good news. And he does it all because he knows that the power, foundation power source of, of Christian growth, which he's calling us to, is the gospel. Okay, so my, my question to you in closing this first point out is, um, are you taking advantage of that, that power source each and every day? Are you, are you filling up on the gospel every day? Are you, are you thinking about the gospel every day? Are you meditating on the gospel in the day-to-day? -day? Are you applying the gospel to your life in the day-to-day? -day? If, if you want to grow, that's a key piece of, of growth. You're not going to grow 
unless you're doing that, okay? So, it brings me to the second point. Um, Peter uh, brings up in end of verse 13, an often neglected key to Christian growth, and that is thinking, what we do with our minds, which I've already been alluding to, okay? The critical role that thinking plays in Christian growth is emphasized throughout the scriptures. And I just picked a, a couple of uh, places to mention to you. So in Joshua 1.8, God is giving instructions to Joshua and, and he ties the importance of thinking to growing. Here's what he says. Uh, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. So you should be thinking about God's word day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Okay, so the purpose for meditating on the Word of God, thinking about it, is so that you will do it, so that you'll grow into doing what uh, is said in it. Okay, we see it in our verse that we've been talking about a lot already today, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Paul says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed. Okay, so, so what does it mean to behold the glory of the Lord? At this point in time, since we can't actually, you know, see him and behold him directly, it has to mean considering him in our minds, considering him in our hearts as we, as we meditate on Christ, as we read about Christ, as we learn about Christ, as we talk about Christ, as we we think about Christ, we are transformed by God as a result of that. So you see the tie there. And then one more verse again from Paul, Romans 12, 2, a famous one. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Okay, so, so how does transformation, how does growth happen? It happens through the renewal, the renewing, of our minds. It happens through thinking. It happens in the mind. It's where it starts. In fact, an important point to make in regard to that is that the word repentance, right, which we always, you know, think about in regard to change. A lot of times we think about repentance, we think well, that means a change of life, a change of behavior, a, a putting off of sin, a putting on of righteousness. But the word repentance actually means to have a change of mind, okay? So, Unless, to repent means to have a change of mind first that leads to a change of heart and a change of action and a change of, of life. And so there again we see the tie between thinking and growth and change. Okay? So, but, but of all of those places in the scripture that talk about that tie, um, <clears throat> I think Peter says it best in 1 Peter 1, 13. He just says it, very vividly using two super vivid examples that I think are really, really helpful. So, so look at 1 Peter 1.13. It says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, there's one, and being sober-minded, that's two, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's the first of the three things that he calls us to do. Okay, but he... He prefaces that first with the gospel, therefore, in light of what I've already said about the gospel. And then he says, talks about the mind, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. So presently and continually, you ought to be preparing your minds for action and you ought to be sober-minded. Now do these things. Keep the gospel in mind. Prepare your minds for action, be sober-minded, and go and do. It's really, really important. We don't think about that enough, the importance of the mind. Now, let me bring out you know, how good Peter is, and, and these examples are good. So what does he mean by preparing our minds for, for action? Okay? The actual phrase there that, it, that is, is meant and used is gird up the loins of your mind, which is a, a phrase that we're very unfamiliar with in the, the modern day, okay? But, but here's, here's what that meant, you know? In, in Peter's day, and in the, the days before his day, uh, people would wear robes, as, as many of you know, okay? For uh, was what was the, the, the wear of the day. 
so what it looked like to gird up your loins, it meant that you would <clears throat> take the back part of your robe and you would take it between your legs and you would, you would tuck it into your belt in front, thus kind of lifting your robe up, making it more like shorts and allowing you to be ready to go, ready to take action. So that's what it meant to gird up your loins. So Peter's calling us to gird up the loins of our mind uh, prepare our minds for action in this first part. And we, we see verses that speak to this. First Kings 18.46 says, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment, he girded up his loins, and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. We see another example of it in Exodus 12.11, where God is instructing uh, instructing uh, Moses on uh, the Passover, the first Passover, he says this, And thus shall you eat the Passover with your loins girded, uh, your, uh, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. Okay, so you should eat this Passover with your loins girded up, your robe ready to go, so that you can take action, so that you can move out. So Peter says here, we need to prepare our minds for action on a regular basis. We need to gird up the loins of our minds, okay? And I think that's a, that's a daily thing. That's a conscious thing. We need to be ready to take action for the Lord by girding up the loins of our minds, especially on the gospel, so that we're ready to go. Yeah, the action starts with the mind. Repentance starts with the mind. Growth starts with the mind. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. Okay, then the second phrase is powerful too, right? Uh, being sober-minded. We need to be sober-minded. And I think the, the, the easiest way to understand what sober-minded means is to think about the opposite of, of sober-minded would be to be drunk-minded, okay? And, uh, you know, so to, to be drunk is to be cloudy, to be drunk is to be, you know, in many ways unaware, uh, to be drunk is to be, you know, making poor decisions in the mind. You know, the opposite of that is sober, to be, to be sharp, to be all there, to be you know, ready to think, to be ready to make good choices. We need to be sober-minded. And then as I mentioned on this, this point, I think that, um, you know, it's particularly important and particularly difficult to be sober-minded for the Lord in this modern day. And I, I think the, you know, the greatest challenge, and it's one that I talk about a lot, I know, but I keep bringing it up, is, is the challenge of of modern technology, the, the challenge of social media, the challenge of this smorgasbord of things to uh, drunken our minds on. Yeah, and so I, we really have to be uh, aware of that. We have to be prayerful about that. We have to, by the grace of God, be self-controlled in the amount of things that we're taking into our mind if we want to be sober-minded for the Lord. Um, if we want to grow, we, we have to have our minds prepared for action. We have to have uh, our minds sober. And if our minds with, are filled with a, a million things, you know, much of which is, is at best um, you know, not helpful, then, then, and then how are we going to be ready to grow if growth starts in the mind? So that's what Peter gets at here for us and and uh, and it, I think this think those images are super helpful okay so so we want to be thinking about the gospel uh, before after during our attempts to grow and we need to be uh, preparing our minds for action gird up the loins of our minds ready to go for the Lord in our our minds and we need to be sober minded and I think a huge piece of that is, is limiting and, and managing uh, the amount of information we're taking in, uh, especially via uh, modern technology today. We gotta be wary of that and watchful there, okay? 
So that brings us to the, the, the last point here. Uh, Peter, uh, after talking about those two things, uh, talks about three areas uh, that we could be growing in, many of which are, are ones that we rarely consider. Okay, So the first one is, is the one that he mentions in, in verse 13 here. So therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's what you should do. The first thing you should do is this. Set your hope fully on future grace, the heavenly inheritance, all the good things to come, either when you pass as a Christian and, and, and head off to heaven or when Jesus comes again. Set your hope fully on that. Okay? And that, that fully is such an extreme word, I think. And we have such a tendency to set our hope, uh, you know, not only not fully on future grace, on, on, on heaven to come, but maybe not at all. I think it's not something that we consider. It's the first thing that Peter says, set your hope fully on the grace that is going to be one day revealed. This, this heavenly inheritance that's being kept, this heavenly inheritance that's being guarded, set your hope fully on that. Why? Why does, why does Peter say that? Okay, I think that the, the answer to why is because unlike any current earthly hope that we could set our hope on, our future hope in Christ is more glorious, is eternal, and is sure, okay? You know, there's all sorts of things that, that we set our hope on in this lifetime. We set our hope on, on jobs and careers. We, we set our hope on relationships, okay? We, we, we set our hope on negative things like being able to uh, make it to the weekend so that we can drink and forget about our problems. You know, we set our hope on our education. We set our hope on, on uh, you know, the next president that's going to be coming. We set our hope on, on all these things. And some of those things aren't bad, but, but none of them are sure. None of them are lasting. None of them are guaranteed. And, and none of them even compare to the glory of the hope that we have in, in heaven that is to come. So he says, set your hope fully on the grace that is to be revealed to you in Jesus Christ. And so that's the first of the commands. You can again see the, the, the mental nature of that. It's what we need to be doing throughout the day. Because the second command comes in 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. He says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Okay, so the second command is this. As obedient children of, of God, we are to behave and act and think and follow in the footsteps of our Father. Okay, the expectation for us as children of God is that we would be obedient to our Father, that we would love Him, that we would respect Him, and that because, you know, it's His seed that has caused us to be born again, we would be like Him, okay? So rather than conforming to the, the passions of our former ignorance, right? When we were apart from Christ, when we were blind to sin, when we were blind to the devil and his schemes, we were living in ignorance. We were living for ourselves. We weren't aware that we were to be living for God. We weren't aware of God's commands. We weren't aware of Christ and what He'd done for us. We were living lives of ignorance, but we're not doing that anymore. Okay, Because of Christ, because of God, we've, we're not ignorant. We've, we've been awoken to the truth. And we need to not be living in that ignorance anymore, okay? And we're tempted to. We still have this flesh that has many of the same desires that it used to have, the desire to be selfish, the desire to be sinful, okay? We have to reckon with that. 
but, but we need to set our minds on this. We, we are children of God. And God is calling us to be obedient children. We need to not conform to the patterns and the passions of our former ignorance, but instead we need to be holy in all of our conduct. And so not just in, in some areas of life, but in all areas of life, we need to be seeking to be obedient, to be living holy set apart lives for God. And we'll be thinking about that, okay? And then the third thing, and the final thing that, that Peter calls us to is in verse 17, where he says, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. Okay? So, this can be a real confusing concept, a confusing command uh, for many born-again Christians. This idea of, of conducting ourselves with, with fear toward God. And I think the, the reason for that makes a lot of sense. You know, we, we are believing as Christians that when we, when we trusted in Christ, um, we went from an enemy of God to, to a friend of God. We, we went from being... Um, separated from God to being uh, a child of God. You know, God has set His love on us in Christ. God has saved us through Christ. God has adopted us as His child, and we should have no reason to fear Him. And all of that is totally true. Okay, but at the same time, in in this passage here, and in in other passages in the Scriptures, New Testament passages like like First Corinthians five. Uh, we're called to fear God as well. And I think the key to understanding that that fear is, um, you know, which is, is what he says in the beginning of verse 17. If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Okay, so... So God is our Father. He loves us. In that sense, we don't need to fear Him. But at the same time, we should have a, a healthy reverence, a healthy respect, and in that sense, a healthy fear of our, our Heavenly Father. We should desire to please Him. We should fear not pleasing Him, not because He's going to stop loving us, but because we love Him and we want to please Him. Okay. And then the other thing is, is we are going to go before Christ at the judgment. God is going to judge us all through Christ. Our, our deeds are going to be laid bare before Him. Every thought, every action is going to be exposed and evaluated. God is impartial. You know, He's not going to, you know, uh, downplay or let us off the hook on the things that we do. Um, now, we need to remember that because of what Christ has done, we're going to be pardoned and forgiven for these wrong things. But at the same time, we are going to, to face that judgment. We are going to have to go before Christ. And, and we want to be able to say like Paul on that last day, you know, I fought the good fight. I've, I've kept the faith. I've finished the race. And now a crown is, is laid up for us. God, we're not going to be perfect. But, you know, during this time of exile, this brief time here on earth, we should be seeking to, uh, you know, live lives that are, are reverent, live lives that are fearful, uh, live lives that are, are respectful of our loving Heavenly Father who is going to one day judge us impartially for our deeds in and through Jesus Christ. Okay, so friends, there you have it. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21. Say, if you want to grow in Christ, this is a super important and helpful passage. They're just reiterating what, what Peter does here. So he starts and ends with the gospel, which is the power source of Christian growth. Okay, We need to do the same thing. We need to start with the gospel. We need to end with the gospel. We need to be thinking about the gospel all the time. And God will use that to transform us. Okay. The second thing that he does is that he reminds us that we need to prepare our minds for action and we need to be sober 
minded. Okay, growth starts with the mind. We have to be filling our minds up with good stuff. We need to be uh, not occupying our minds too much with with mundane or bad things. That's going to prepare us to be obedient. That's going to prepare us to change. We have our minds ready to go. And then lastly, he gives us these three really important commands that we often don't think about, that we need to set our hope fully on the grace that is in the future, this future grace, this grace to come, this life is short, hope in the future, check yourself when you're hoping too much in the present, okay? Secondly, uh, we need to not be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance, but instead as obedient children, as children of the King, we need to live holy lives as God is holy. Okay, and then lastly, um, we need to, to conduct our lives during this earthly exile with a healthy fear of our Father and the fact that one day we're going to be judged. So I hope that those things are helpful for you. I hope that you'll be thinking about those things throughout the week. And I hope that God will use those things to help you to grow in the areas that you feel Jesus is calling you to grow in. On that note, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this sweet, powerful passage of Scripture. God, I thank you uh, for the way that you uh, help us to grow not only by and through your Holy Spirit, but also through your Word. And I just pray for that, that powerful combination that it would happen in us this week, that you would use... 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21, your word there, and you would take, take it, Holy Spirit, and lay it on our minds, and lay it on our hearts, and help us to grow as a result of it, God. We praise you this morning, we thank you, and we pray that you would be with us here the rest of the week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
that day When you come back to claim your down praise you forever at your throne yes we will sing your love your love has saved me by your grace I now draw near your love has set me Father, I just thank you again for being in control, for being sovereign, for overseeing our lives. All parts of them, good, bad, challenge, victory, all of it. And Lord, I just, I, I would ask again, uh, you know, we're supposed to be having our, our church picnic next week and, and, uh, and we can't do that, Lord, unless some things fall into place. And so I, I again ask for uh, good health for the body, that we would all be um, taking care of ourselves, that we would all be uh, living our lives, but but living them wisely, uh, especially in, in these times, Lord. And so I just, I thank you again for, uh, for all that you do for us, for your love for us, for your protection over us, Lord, I thank you uh, personally for helping to to get this service together this morning. You know, we we obviously were scrambling and and sort of punting here, Lord. And I I just pray that what we do is honoring to you. I thank you for helping us to get through it. It's tough getting up this early to start singing, Lord. And uh, so I just I I thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And uh, please be with us throughout our week. Amen. Okay. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for your flexibility. Be safe out there. Be informed. Be well. God bless.